good morning. Uh, thanks for inviting me. I'll try my best. Uh, the challenge uh, was take technology, look at it, and uh, answer the question how this will influence design of new hospital. Uh, it's a struggle, I must tell you. When I started looking at it, I said there are hundreds of points where technology interacts with hospital design. I have 20 minutes, uh, not 40, and uh, how do we do it? And I had to select a single factor, go after it. So uh, at least my intention in this presentation today is to do a generic assessment analysis, close the loop into design, and, and then you could take it as, as a model and, and utilize it and use it. So this is what I've selected. Uh, I look, there is a huge issue with healthcare and the cost of healthcare. So I stepped back and I said, where technology is influencing dramatically cost? And I'm sure any one of you read research papers in this field, technology is being pointed to or blamed as a major cost increase factor in, in uh, operation and, and delivery of healthcare. So uh, in essence, I went back and said, okay, let's select a couple of factors where cost is being driven and address them. Uh, the first major factor in, in cost of healthcare is aging population. Uh, the population that being treated today in hospitals are becoming older and older and older, you know the numbers. Uh, this is increasing dramatically, cost of healthcare. Uh, the second interesting factor is that out, outliers, meaning those, uh, the patients or the people that are coming to the hospital and are beyond or above the average issues. Uh, the disease is more significant, it's more critical, acute situation. Uh, what I've learned is that uh, about 5 to 20, let's say 10% of the patients are using almost 50% of the resources of a hospital. So this is another group that is driving uh, dramatically cost. Then pharmaceutical technology, and now we are saying, okay, what can we do with technology to address it? And to, to answer a question like this, you need to go back and analyze the factors that drive cost in each one of those. So what I've done here, and you, you see it while I'm, I'm looking at it here, uh, when you're looking on aging population, recuperating from treatment is a struggle. Each one of us knows from our parents and so on that if something goes wrong for a younger person to recuperate, generally very easy. We may lose old uh, people because they are old and it's very, very slow process. They are much more acute and critical to, to treatments this is an issue we need to look at and see if we can avoid it. Uh, there is a significant variability and sensitivity combined in old patients, meaning a statistical treatment, as Shlomo mentioned before, is not good enough. You treat statistically, yes, you may gain some level of, of success, but there is a significant percentage that would not respond to the treatment. And then you are paying for it and nothing good come out of it. Outliers, the issue here is uh, when you analyze the cost of these outliers, you learn very quickly that the first couple of days are critical. Uh, the stay, long-term stay, is not dramatic, but these one, two, three days are very, very expensive. So if there is any way to shorten it, it will be very important. Technology. When, again, looking on medicine today, you could see this process where diagnosis is multi-tiered. We do step one, then decide, do step two, three, four. Now in retrospect, when you look back, and it's very easy to be smart in retrospect, but that's life. When you look back, you could say, we didn't need to do this, we didn't need to do this, we could have jumped directly to this point. If we will be able to do it, we can save a lot of money. Uh, therapeutic technologies, again, uh, there is, it's statistical today, mostly statistical, 
and the fact that it is statistical is taking the basic cost and multiplying it by the probability of success, okay? So trying to avoid statistical therapy and going into definitive therapy could save significantly money or significant money. <coughs> Decided not to change. Okay. Okay, after going very quickly through this, if you saw that Shlomo uh, talked about the future, I'm going to take you one step beyond this. Meaning, uh, instead of speaking about minimal invasive therapy, I'm going to speak about completely non invasive therapy, outpatient non invasive therapy. <coughs> So what I'm going to talk or to cover or describe is a therapy that is using acoustic beam, highly focused acoustic beam, to destroy tissue only at the focus inside the body. How could this happen? I could have started this part of, of my uh, presentation by asking you, do you believe or describe to you a therapy and say, when do you believe this will happen? So instead of going through this process, I'll take a step back and I'll say it is existing today. The therapy allows you, without going into all the technical details, to treat deep inside the bone, only the target, sparing non-targeted tissue, avoiding collateral damage. Now, it sounds great. The problem is, how do you know that you treat the target? How do you know in real time that you achieved your goal and you treat it? So to do this, we need to do something that in engineering, you are in the Technion, is called closed loop process. We need to take the data on the outcome and allow the user to change parameters real time during treatment and see to this that he will, he or she, will be able to say, okay, I destroyed the whole tumor in real time. And if you did not, change the parameter and see to this that you'll do it. To do this, we need some type of modality that will turn the patient body into a transparent body and will allow you to get real-time feedback on treatment outcome. This is what you see here. And I'll show you now. Okay. So here we'll see an animation or should see an animation. I don't know, uh, we won't waste on this time. In essence, the patient is being treated while continuously the patient is being imaged by MRI. Now, why MRI? By now we know that radiation, in general, when you start accumulating a significant dose, is very risky. This is number one. Number two, remember that I spoke about the ability, the ability to identify that you have destroyed the target. The way to do it, the only surrogate today in, in medicine to tissue viability is temperature. So we need an imaging modality that will be able to measure temperature in situ, inside the body in real time and tell you, you did destroy the target. MRI is the only imaging modality that can do it. It's not because uh, Shlomo mentioned that uh, all operating rooms will be with MRI, but this is the only modality that can do it. This is how it looks. Uh, here you could see a closed loop therapy, meaning the user is continuously watching <coughs> this information temperature with a resolution of one by one millimeter, meaning in, in, in a tiny resolution, a very high resolution, the user could identify that we destroy this volume of tissue and see to this that the whole tissue that was targeted will be ablated. <coughs> This is an example. Look on the upper. I see we, no, this works. Okay, so this is a sagittal cut like this through the body. Uh, you could see the spine, and this is what is called myoma or fibroid. And today, uh, the gold standard of therapy is his, either hysterectomy or myomectomy. Here you could see a treatment that it, the tumor was destroyed. Inside the body, you could see what will happen over time. All this was a tumor before treatment. 
this is after 12 months, the body is removing the dead tissue. But think about it. Instead of going through abdominal surgery with weeks at home and days, one, two, three, four days at the hospital, patient walks in three hours later, she's back on her daily life, back to work, back to the family. One example. I had no clue that uh, Shlomo will mention deep brain stimulation as the future or future today. Deep brain stimulation is placing electrodes into the brain using electronic signals to try and overcome functional disease in the brain, epi epilepsy, Parkinson, tremor, and so on. <clears throat> this is an example how you do it without touching the skull. So here you could see a treatment for essential tremor. <coughs> Again, this is a cut like this through the brain. And this is where this cut was taken. Okay, so very deep inside the brain in an area that is called the thalamus. The thalamus, in essence, is a switchboard that is controlling signals in the brain. So if some area went uncontrolled in the brain by cutting the wire, you could stop This is the following. So uh, on the right side here, you could see the trick. This is a test where a patient that is suffering from essential tremor is being asked to draw a straight line to follow a template of a spiral. And this is before the treatment, and this is at the end of the treatment, which means the video clip which okay you need to believe me time on this. So when we look back on our list, you could see that this technology is addressing some major needs, unmet needs, in trying to control cost of healthcare. It is completely outpatient. Patient comes in, no hospitalization, immediately at the end of the treatment, the patient goes home. Okay, so think about it from productivity point of view, from family life, from, from society, this is an effect. The second one is, it's a non-statistical therapy anymore. We look on the same, on a specific patient, specific organ, and watching in real time, not we, the, the physician that is operating the machine, watching in real time and deciding if this is whatever they wanted to do. Now, the therapy is being driven both anatomically, functionally, and so on. Everything that Shlomo went through is part, integrated part of this system. Back again to the question that I started with, okay, great, interesting, you have a great technology, how this is influencing design of hospitals, okay? Because to me, this is a question why I'm here today. So the number one is, if 
more and more, and this is, by the way, this is a trend today, if, if more and more therapies will be outpatient therapies, we will need areas where outpatient therapy could be performed and you need a very short recovery, maybe half an hour, one hour, and the patient should be on his way home. Now, should we spread it over the hospital or should be these treatment areas should be centralized? So interestingly enough, a month ago at Texas, at Dallas, I met with, with uh, a team from UT, University of Texas at Dallas, and they asked, okay, what will happen because something can go wrong? Okay, you could be in, in, in the middle of, of a completely theoretically outpatient therapy and something went wrong and now you need emergency reaction, okay? The hospital that they were, came from had a centralized surgical rooms and a close by reaction team for, for emergencies and I said, okay, we are about a mile away. How are we going to see to this that we'll have emergency team running to us? Do we need some means of transportation or, or physical connection? Should everything be combined or spread all over? A question. Again, I'm, I'm not here to tell you answers. I'm, I'm raising information that I heard as open questions. Um, can we, is, is there a possibility to develop a generic outpatient therapy module? A cell like uh, you do in, in, in architecture that you could multiply and could this be uh, how we address outpatient therapies? I don't know, a, a, an open question. Now, when I ended this for myself, when, when I ended this process, it looked to me, I, I went back again to my background, which is engineering, not medicine. Uh, I went uh, back and said, in this type of lack of knowledge, probably the right design is a very flexible design, meaning could you build something that could adapt easily over time, not over 40 or 50 years, but over 10 years, because to me, the changes are going to be very significant. So that's about my inputs to you about uh, hospital design.